بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المحصومين الصادقين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد respected scholars, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Having already examined a set of characteristics of Prophet Luqman, was he a prophet or no? No. Having already examined the characteristic of the wise man that is Luqman, we found an examination of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had seen within him the qualities that he used to reconcile the differences of the people. And that although he was not a prophet of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicated a chapter to him in the Quran, chapter 31. And we had examined as well the reality of the humility of Luqman, as well as examining the fact that this man, part of humility was that he was a slave in his life. And we had examined slavery from a set of different angles. And another area in which we examine Luqman is the area that Luqman was seen as being a slave of black descent. And therefore, when a person looks at this area of Luqman, an important connotation is this, is that the story therefore had a historical base and a contemporary significance in relation to Arabia at the time. Because if you imagine when this story is being revealed to the Arabians, we find that it is being revealed to a set of people who saw the black man as being a slave or for that matter, saw any non-Arab as being a slave to them. Because many people have the impression that the only people who were seen as being slaves in Arabia were the black. But if they could find a Roman, they would take him as a slave. And for example, if they could find a Persian, they would even take him as a slave. For as you know, amongst the great companions of our Holy Prophet was Bilal, the Abyssinian, Suhaib, the Roman, Salman, the Persian, and therefore you found that any opportunity to take a non-Arab as a slave, they would always see the non-Arabs as being lower. And therefore when we examine the subject that Luqman was of black descent, it brings us onto the discussion of the idea of how Islam sought to bring a philosophy of coexistence between the human beings. We find that many of us within this crowd even today, and virtually everywhere you go in the world, we find the world is a cosmopolitan world. The world is one of different races, different tribes, different backgrounds. And therefore, when you examine this, the religion of Islam had to come with a philosophy. And the philosophy had to be centered on the idea that recognizing we are all of different races and tribes and religions, the religion of Islam came with a philosophy of unity. But the philosophy of unity which the religion of Islam came with was on three different levels. And only when you understand these three different levels will you understand why Bilal was so attracted to the honey that was around Rasulullah. Without understanding the unity on three levels, a person will not understand the meaning of coexistence in Islam. Because if you want to see Jahiliya again, look in some of the Arab states and you will see that Jahiliya is returning because the racism is coming back again. You find that when you go, for example, to certain countries, we don't care to mention, that you find that they treat the brown man or the black man as still being a servant. They can't fathom in their head that a person who is brown or black can be anything higher. I remember a friend of mine going towards one country for pilgrimage and the friend that he went with was a diplomat from India, young man, diplomat. He's got a diplomatic status. Even before he's shown his passport, he's deci they've decided to say to him and treat him in a way where, you know, when they flick their fingers like this. 
And they are meant to be those who are telling us about the history of Islam. They flick the fingers. As soon as he took our diplomatic passport, they started worshipping him. And it shows you that the racism is still there within certain countries which claim to be Islamic. When the Quran examined unity, the Quran looked at unity in three different ways. The first way the Quran looked at unity was by looking at unity between Muslims. That us Muslims, there has to be a unity between us. That there are some Muslims in the world today who follow the school of Ahlul Bayt. There are other Muslims in the world today who, for example, follow other schools. There are many sects in the religion of Islam. How do I live with these sects? Do I go around abusing them? Do I go around saying there's no need for me to say Assalamu Alaikum to them? Or is it that I recognize that there may be a need for us to unite? Now, of course, unity does not mean I compromise my beliefs. No, I maintain my beliefs. But I recognize that there are others who have, number one, different beliefs to me. And number two, the only way I can portray my beliefs as being the correct way is through my akhlaq. My akhlaq will do more talking than whatever knowledge I have. I can come to someone and say to him that in your book this is written, in your book this is written. But if he doesn't see me come with hikmah and with mawada hasana when I speak to him, he's not going to come towards me. That's why the first level of unity in the Quran, if you go to Surah 3, verse 103 in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on to the rope of Allah, all of you together, and do not disunite. The first level of unity Islam wanted to build was addressing the Muslims themselves. But before you tell everyone else about joining Islam, you should unite between yourself. That's why this verse was revealed in relation to the Aws and the Khazraj. The Aws and the Khazraj had been the main tribes in Medina. And these people had been following pagan ways until our holy prophets went there and spread the religion of Islam. Now these people, having originally been enemies, when Islam came to their hearts, they all became united. What happened was that sometimes when they would sit together, sometimes the old days would come back to them. Or sometimes they try and vie for a place above each other. So one day the Aws and the Khazraj, their main leaders were sitting down. And one of the Aws came forward and said, we had Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. And one of the Khazraj said, we had Mu'ad bin Jabal. And one of the Aws came forward and said, we had Khuzayma bin Thabit. And one of the Khazraj, for example, came forward and said, we had Zayd bin Thabit. And suddenly there became an argument between these two who had come to Islam. Their argument was who had the greater Muslims. Likewise today we find between ourselves, there are some who say, oh we have companions so and so. And the other school says, no we have him. And then the other school comes back and say, no we have him. And you find them quarreling, not through academic, but through the idea that we had such and so great a figure. The only reason this person is a great figure is not because of his name. It's because you want to represent his action. So when I come to discuss with another school in Islam that I have so and so companion, I am not discussing so I put down the other school. I am discussing to tell that these companions were the ones who remained on haq with Rasulullah. The Aws and the Khazraj, when they fought each other, all of a sudden they started saying, we have him, we have him, we have him, we have him. And they went back to the old Arab ways, which was not looking at the taqwa of the person, but looking at his tribal status. So the Quran said, وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ 